Hey everybody, so welcome to part two of this mini series where I talk to Mike Atkin about how do you get Knowledge Graph off the ground at your organization? And if you missed it, part one, I'll link up above if you wanna go and check that out first, where I am interviewing Mike on his recommendations. Well, today he is going to be interviewing me on my recommendations based on the four different times I've had to kick a knowledge graph off the ground and build out teams and architecture to support it. All right, so with that, let's go get started. All right, so uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, you know, this is Mike Atkin. Uh, we got a little special treat today because we're going to turn the tables and have a conversation <laughs> with Ashley about something that I think is really important when you're looking at the business case, right? You know, we have to um, make sure that we're also explaining to all the stakeholders, what does this actually mean to do a knowledge graph? Mm -hmm. Because that's a really big um, uh, concept that most people don't understand, so, if you listen to our previous uh, discussion, we were kind of making the case of why this is important. Mm -hmm. So actually for this one, let's kind of continue that conversation. Yeah. That. So let's, um, let's kind of frame it by saying you've made the strategic case inside your organization to your uh, you know, stakeholders, your executive mm -hmm. stakeholders. Um, what is required from your, your perspective to clear that runway that we are yeah. you know, hopefully getting well, I think um, one thing you have to do well is identify your champions. That doesn't mean find someone that knows what a knowledge graph is because you won't find them most of the time. I think that's changing a little bit because, you know, that's in the Gartner hype cycle and, you know, all that. So, you know, some CTOs are, are aware of it. Uh, but no, you, you need to find the folks that are going to be the ones you have to get sign off from. So either they're the ones who have to give you the team, the dev teams, or the ability to get something with your dev team to, to do it. If you have to get um, some kind of budgetary requirements, make sure you know who that person is. You need to identify all of these folks. Who owns that data? That's going to be your biggest challenge. Like who owns the data today? Because they're probably not going to like you messing and mucking around in their databases, right? So you have to understand who your real audience is. It's not always just my CTO. I mean, sometimes it's an obscure person that you probably don't even know deep down in the data stack somewhere that they know where the bodies are buried. Therefore, if you can win them over, they're going to be your advocates as well in all of these meetings. They're not going to be challenging you because you've already addressed their, their concerns. So how and do so you make the connection between the um, knowledge requirement, the education requirement of data and standards and graph capabilities mm -hmm. and that um, uh, application driver? How did you, how, did, how does one think about that problem? So it doesn't have to be the same person. I mean, like what I did was uh, I put my data therapist hat on, right? I, I I coined that term and I use it all the time because you have to go and talk to people and find out where are those bodies buried and why are they buried? Why are you shoving this stuff under the rug and you you don't? It's just such a hard problem you can't even look to look, you know stand to look at it. But they have to be aware that there's a problem, right? That, 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 that not always, not always. Problem, right? Sometimes they just know that there is something so complicated that nobody really handles it. They know there's something, something smells fishy, so to speak, but they mm -hmm. don't always know how to put a label on what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're looking for is you're looking for things that are highly connective, right? So the problem that is, that is in front of you is highly connective. That, that kind of indicates a graph might be, might be a solution. Yep. And then you start to unpack that. So with, with what I was doing, I was looking at, you know, query expansion was our first use case. This was something that was being discussed in 2014, right? Long time ago, yep. um, according to when this was filmed. <laughs> and the problem was as an aggregator of content, you get taxonomies from every person on the planet. One person calls it Meglev. One person calls it magnetic levitation train. One person uses unique ideas. One person doesn't. Like you, it's all over the place. They have different hierarchies. It's a complete nightmare. If you call the marriage it. counseling problem of data, right? Yeah. You know, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I came in and I saw that there was a solution in place to address this, which was a many-to-many -many mapping. Yep. And I saw that they couldn't update things very quickly. There was things that you know if somebody maybe had a bad day because they were doing it manually and maybe, you know, they mapped it a little funny. Uh, it was just highly uh, exhaustive to do anything with this system, even though the system even by itself existing was a feat that, yeah. that it even existed. And the whole reason my knowledge graph could get, you know, as much success as quickly as it did, because we got the like true knowledge graph. The thing we had before was knowledge graph like, 
it was like a knowledge graph, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was begging to be a knowledge graph. <laughs> That's where I looked at it and said, you know, let's try something here, right? And and we we built it out uh, a very small data set um, from that larger one into a true knowledge graph, and we first got the buy-in from search by showing how it was more effective in doing the query expansion and how we shortened true story. We shortened our, our runtime from a three month uh, data refresh to three day refresh because we went with knowledge graph instead. So the demonstration of value was essential in getting that clear, yeah. clear pathway available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. One of the things that I think about, not, not only who are the advocates that you have to recruit, but you also have to worry about the people who are the obstacles, right? Yeah. Because you want to convince them that, you know, that this is not going to be, you know, jeopardize their world. Right, right. right. Um, um, and, and there are obstacles, right? There is, uh, you know, people, people don't understand this. Yeah. They have their own activities and they've invested their life yep. in building their existing. Yep. And now you have to say, you know, there's additional, there's more. And that must have been also a, a yeah, it, that I'm glad you point that out because the job security thing has always been one of the main blockers for any of this to, to get off the ground. And it's because everything was done manually. SMEs have security in their minds that their job is safe because nobody else has the same information and knowledge that they do. And so they are very protective of it. And what I have found is incredibly helpful is making sure that the folks know that you're just because you start to teach the machine what you know doesn't mean the machine replaces you. In fact, it makes your job easier because what you do, it's it's almost like I always, uh, I when I started working, I was like 14 or 15, right? I worked at a Kmart. They don't even exist anymore. And I remember going through and like folding things when they were messed up, you know, in the, in the clothing department. And I just remember standing there folding things, making things look nice and a customer coming behind me and messing it all up again. And I'm just thinking, now I'm going to have to go do that all over again. Right. That's so annoying. It's so frustrating. That is all the manual processes that we all are dealing with at our, our day jobs. You go in and you fix it and you, you put your knowledge in and now you got to do it again and, over, and again and yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. The machine is no different than a, than the calculator. Could you do it on your own? Two plus two equals four. Yes. But why not use the thing that's going to be a tool to, to help your job go faster and more efficiently? You have to keep people to keep the machines going, right? Yeah. If you're doing auto classification, if you're doing any kind of machine learning or knowledge graph, that knowledge comes from people and you can automate it to heck and back, but you still need people to continuously up, you know, keep the, yeah, the, the information coming and, and making sure that the machine doesn't go off the rails because it's not a set it and forget it moment. Well, you and know, I, it's kind of funny because uh, nobody really wants to be a data janitor, right? The, right. the people, the people that you're supporting are innovative, and they want to be able to use the data and work with it. And, exactly. You know, when that light bulb goes off, I bet you the whole orientation shifts a little bit, you know. And kind yeah. Of willing. Yeah, it's, to it's demystifying it. In many cases, that's a that's a big part of this channel is demystifying it, so that if you are that person doing the manual work you are valued. The data right. that you have in your brain is so incredibly valuable. And just because you are helping automate more of it into a machine of some sort doesn't decrease your value. It in, in fact, increases your value. We know this is group dynamics way more than yeah. technology innovation. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. And sociologists are really the ones we want, want to do. Because we we're talking about stakeholders, I was thinking first the technology stakeholders. And we've mm -hmm. got to work with, like, this is the partnership mm -hmm. that must exist in an organization. And you do kind of want to get that strategic alignment with the people who own the technology, the CIO, the CTO. Yeah. And there is some technology requirements here. Yeah. Not, yeah. not huge, but they do yeah. exist. You know, so yeah. let's, let's put that in context. What, what is required to have a functional knowledge graph infrastructure for yeah. an organization? Yeah, no, I love that question. So first and foremost, get UIDs. <laughs> None of this works without UIDs. Um, the other thing that you have to do is scope appropriately. I know that sounds like, well, of course you're going to sc scope appropriately, but very often I see people doing canonical model work where it's like a huge lift and shift. And it's like, no, no, you can do more of like a data fabric approach or a data mesh approach even where you're taking a very specific business need and you identify who are the players involved and then they contribute what data is MVP for answering that question. And that's how you scope it well. You find out who owns the data, where it lives, like all of that. Um, so those are the two main things. I mean, it's not, it's not all about 
building the knowledge graph. It's about those two pieces. I think that you were talking about a shared internal lexicon with all of the stakeholders, not just the data ontologies and harmonization of the content, but how do we talk to the people in our organization? about oh, yeah. what this is and what, and what is an ID and, and how, does, <laughs> yeah. you know, how does a unique identification work? I mean, so yeah. all of those things are really foundational knowledge that people must have if they're going to be good partners. Yeah. And don't overcomplicate it. Like, I feel like a lot of folks talk about this common lexicon and then they immediately like dive into a company wide lexicon. And like, if you can get to that point, that's fabulous. But you know what I do? I put a a glossary in the beginning of all my, so you're either a white paper company or a PowerPoint (laughs) company. You're one of the two, right? So whichever one you are, uh, put a glossary in the very beginning of, of what you're writing at for stakeholders and define what these things mean. And that's the starting point. And After doing so many of these, uh, you're going to start to build out a common glossary. And if you're lucky enough to have a data catalog, plop it into the data catalog. But not all of us have those. So at the very least, start to put it into your communications. And that's going to help a lot. Well, you're getting down to the core concept of meaning, not words, right? Which is, yeah. yeah, And and most people do understand that because they operate in a world of meaning, you know. Um, So... um, one of the things that I think about when I look at this kind of this physical infrastructure, when, particularly when you mention the IDs, is the challenges we have in harmonization of data from existing to graph, you know, this mapping challenge. <laughs> There's yeah. no getting around it, right? We, we must yeah. get data synced up across repositories yep. and between relational yep. and knowledge graphs. So this, yep. I'd, I'd be very curious about the pathways that you yeah. have to cross to deal with this. So, I mean, that's where those UIDs come into play, though, is if you can get those UIDs in place and you can, I mean, most things have IDs of some sort, like key value pairs is very common, right? Then take, (laughs) right, there's a lot of IDs out there. So take a stance on how you're going to craft a true UID because then you can turn it into a URI. And that's where linked data practices come into play, where you have the ability to, instead of having to pick up all the data, move it over here, now map it together and push it over that way. When you are using linked data, you don't have to do that. The the linked data are pointers to those UIDs that are actionable. So they look like like a URL because they're actionable, right? Like it, it points to the data. So you don't have to keep rehashing it over and over again. And then you get less and less data fidelity. It's like playing the game telephone. How many times did you you know, copy this content over and each time somebody might be changing it in a different way. And then you don't know what the true case was. Very important. Let's not go too fast. So this is critical, right? You know, there's a distinction between the things yeah. and the identification of the exactly. thing. Exactly. And then you mentioned the duplication of the identification of the things. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, one must get straight <laughs> in order to yeah. fix this problem, right? Yep. Of everything being in silos and having its own orientation. So yep. it's a challenge, right? It's a, it's a, yep. a task that you know, um, doesn't go away easily. No, and you can't, yeah, and you can't get around that mapping. But the thing is, you know, I I remember uh, talking to someone about this and they're like, yeah, but isn't that going to add time to market? It's going to add time to market uh, because we have to do this mapping instead of just completely rewriting everything. Mm -hmm. And what I told them was how much time you got? (laughs) Because if you want to completely redo the entire database, architecture, queries, consumers, if you have the time and the money, and it's going to cost you millions to do, and many years, I know this for a fact, knowing a few few folks that have done that, then go ahead. You're right. It will decrease the time to market if you do all of that. But by that time, your competitors and everybody else will have moved past you, and you will have so much technical debt underneath you, you won't be able to breathe. Or You can add a few milliseconds because it's not linked. That's the beauty of linked data. It's not adding a ton of compute time to to the queries that you have to run. It's not adding, you know, an additional like day or two, right? It's not even an hour. And now if you're like dealing in the stock market, maybe that is astronomical for you and you can't do it. That's your call to make what your business feels is appropriate. But it's, you get time to market much faster. You get the benefits of this much faster. I think we can all agree to is if you're entering this journey, don't try to learn how to do it on your own for yeah. your first UK. Exactly. Work with, work with those oh, yep. pros. Exactly. Exactly. Demonstrate value. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You you need a springboard. And what I, I, I did this, right? I've done this, not where I'm at now, but at a, a previous place. 
we used a third party. We took the great stuff that we had. We had, you know, our, our knowledge transfer on what is the vision? What is the first use case? What's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck? Then we went out to a third party and, and they helped us build out the initial knowledge graph. Now I was on staff, right? So they did have at least one person that did do knowledge graph, but you don't always need a me, right? Like there's a lot of consultancies that have a me that you can borrow for. for. And you're we suggesting got it off that the, the initial team is not, you do not need a huge investment in people and skill sets exactly. to get your initial. Yeah. Right? And this actually and gives you the opportunity important. to. Yeah, this gives you the opportunity to upskill people too, mm-hmm. because as you get this going, the consultants are going to be helping you figure out like who at the organization, like they're going to ask the questions and then you go, wait, I know the person that knows this. And then you go and talk to them and guess what? They might be a good candidate for upskilling. So for and, from smart architectural staff inside to mm-hmm. now becoming knowledge graph co- capable, what's the, uh, what's the journey time? I mean, is this, yeah, I mean, or is this it, easy? Yeah. it's, it's, it's going to depend on your use case that you choose, but we got our knowledge graph again at a previous company uh, up and running. I think it was now there was a lot of pre mapping that they had done through many, many, many years. That was a huge benefit. It would have taken a, a year if we didn't have that, but we did have that. So it took us three months. You mean to they, get they it knew the, the data, right? You know, the people already knew the data. Correct. That's what we yep. mean by pre mapping, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They already knew the data. They already had connected the databases they needed yep. to talk to each other. That already was done. It just didn't have a graph. Yep. And so uh, we got spun up in about three months. And in that time, we hired, I was already on staff. Uh, we hired two uh, knowledge graph engineers uh, that one knew Sparkle and the other knew Cypher. And between the two of them, uh, we took we took another three months to take it away from that third party. So you always need an exit strategy. Can't say that enough. Always have an exit strategy. Yeah, but three people in three months is a pretty nice um, uh, time frame. You know, that, yeah, that, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it helps that we had good people that we hired. And that doesn't mean you can't do it with, you know, folks that are just learning. You absolutely can. It's just going to add a few, a few months to, to what you're doing. As we think about the product management role, mm-hmm. what are the key things that you think about, you know, skills and pipelines and governance and, you know, what, yeah. what the, you know, yeah, you, you, the product manager? Yeah. I mean, I think data products are, I don't want to say they're new. I mean, they've always existed. I just think recently we've kind of identified them as such. And what this means is there's a, a role out there called the technical product manager. Mm-hmm. And what this means is you're a unicorn. And they're really hard to find. Not only do you have to understand go to market and how to create business, you know, business plans and, uh, you know, define persona and do market research, but you also then have to be able to switch hats very quickly and go and talk to the deep, deep, deep engineer who is, you know, building out this very specific um, Jenkins job for something in your pipeline. You need to be able to run that entire gambit. And that's what I do. And it's it's something that does take a lot of experience to, to pick up on. Because Must I we think find a lot unicorns of- to run a uh, knowledge graph infrastructure? Is that because that could be a thing that we have to think about? Like I, I, you described it well, right? You know, architecture, SME knowledge, data knowledge, uh, yep. you know, um, program management knowledge. I mean, yep. that's rare. That's a rare it thing. It is very rare. And this is why I say this, though. It doesn't mean you can't do knowledge graph without a unicorn. It means right now in the industry, there's not enough experience, not from a, from a people perspective, but from a business perspective, just like data scientists years ago, right? Like everybody was like, what's a data scientist? Oh, what's a data scientist? Like the, mm-hmm. you, you seen these, right? Like let's define data scientists. And now we're all like, yeah, it's a data scientist. Like we all just understand what it is now. Mm-hmm. It's, it's to that stage now where we're like, okay, well we need just like in the old data scientist days, we need a data scientist that does visualization, does this, does this, does this, does this. just like all these, because we weren't mature in industry enough to understand truly what you need. That's where we're at right now with Knowledge Graph. I'm curious, I'm curious, what does it take to go from starting a project to a, a center of excellence? And what, what would that look like? So first, I don't call, I, I don't call them center of excellence um, or communities of practice or any of those things because oftentimes those get bad raps, in my opinion, in, in an organization because they're fads. They're going to spin up lots of energy and then they're just going to die. So I, I stay away from that terminology. But what I use do is um, now it helps that I am using a lean agile. So we have like very dedicated teams. We have epics, we have features, we have user stories. All of that helps define exactly who you need to have involvement. 
Mm -hmm. um, if you're not using those things, look it up. You can still use it even if you're not really using it. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, and Agile was, makes it easier. It does. A hundred percent. It does. And, and that's that end and having it across the entire organization. I know a lot of people use Agile only in the tech department, wherever they're at, but we use it, like even our HR department uses it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that is incredibly helpful because everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows when you're looking at a feature, when you're looking at a capability, you can clearly see the business value. You can clearly see the persona and what is the acceptance criteria? It's a contract. Getting them aligned is really an outcome. Yes, of, of course. Right? And, and we have this other thing that has been very helpful in, in the knowledge graph space, which is called an ADR, um, which is um, Agile uh, Decision Record. That's what it is, Agile Decision Record. And what that is, is anytime we decide on a piece of technology over another piece. So when we were looking at graph databases, we compared not just performance, but cost, usability, because a lot of graph databases have UIs, not other, other kinds of uh, like relational databases don't usually have a UI component to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that all went into how we decided we went with one or the other. So if anybody you know comes into the company and they're like, well, wait a minute, why did you pick this graph database over that one? We can. We don't have to revisit. We just point them to the the item of record in our data right. governance, right? And graph is constantly changing. New machine learning stuff is coming up all the time, so we can constantly revisit that on a data governance schedule to make sure we still have the right tool for the job. It's also one of the benefits of doing standards, right? That it's yes. uh, you know, open and you can migrate and you get yep. extends. You know, and that's yep. that's one. I, I I like the idea of standards better than I like the idea of knowledge graph personally. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. You know. That's the goal. Yeah. All right, let, let me let me ask you three questions to wrap this up, if I may, sure. Ashley. Um, so as you um, earn the stripes across your back by living in the trenches, <laughs> give us the key lesson. What what what? When someone's thinking about yeah. their journey, what what should they know that you are? Uh, yeah. So so first, uh, always start with the the assets. What kind of assets? What state are they in? Because if you're doing knowledge graph on images, but you don't have any image recognition software, guess what? You're going to be limited in what you can do. If you are dealing with uh, content and that content is in Word documents or worse, it's it's not even OCR. It's just like a flat image. So the text doesn't actually exist for a text reader. You're in trouble. So I, I always say if you're starting something out at a new organization, especially, make sure you understand what kind of assets and what state they're in. Uh, I'm, the next... sorry, I'm sorry. So this is this is really your asset inventory and your data inventory and your capability yep. inventory. So start with inventory. Is that the message? Yeah. Uh, what yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Me. I mean, it's your foundation. It, it, you're most of the time knowledge graph is facilitating facilitating search, whether it's in analytics or it's fraud detection. It's searching right. and, and uncovering something. If you don't know what that something is, what are you doing? Yep. <laughs> so, uh, get, so that's... get the basics right. Yeah, and the basics, right. right. And it's reusable and extendable and you yeah. understand it and, and yeah. it relates to everything else. Yeah. Um, um, the corollary to that is um, um, obstacles that you should avoid to... Um, yeah, obstacles to avoid. Um, it's, it's, it, it's a good sign when you get people very fired up and very excited where people start running around the company and saying, oh, we got knowledge up, we're doing knowledge graph. Let that go on for a tiny little bit of time, but not too much time because you very quickly need to then do that, that stakeholder management and bring them back down to earth because it's very exciting when you start to do the sexy thing that's out there. But you, you, what I started to see was everybody started saying, oh, well, there's a knowledge graph over here. It wasn't a knowledge graph, right? Like people just started using the word because they thought it was cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it caused a lot of confusion and to the point where I had to make a cheat sheet uh, for the business on Here's what people are calling a knowledge graph. Yeah, yeah. Here's what is actually a knowledge graph. And I, I even showed them very simple data structures. So like this thing is related to this thing in this certain way, you yeah. know, that sort of thing. And, and that was very helpful. But yeah, that, that uh, stakeholder expectations, um, they're going to think it's magic. They are going to think that it's going to solve all of their problems. And you need to be very cautious of that. Um, and be careful of Google. <laughs> get ahead of Google because as soon as you start saying, well, this is called a knowledge graph. This is called a class. Guess what? Your stakeholders going to be like, oh, Google, what does this mean? And, and guess what? They're not going to find what you are saying. I mean, most of the stuff out there on knowledge graph is very general because yes. it's, 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 it's from vendors and that's okay. Yes. Um, but you need to craft the narrative and you need to be very explicit with it for your company and for your organization. Because if you don't, Google will define it for you and you don't want that. 
I think that's what you mean by clarity and demystification, right? You know, set, set exactly. Parameters. Ah, well, fantastic. So, Ashley, th- thank you for sharing the practical reality of this. Well, you know? Thank you for the idea, Mike. This is fun. I, yeah. I, I haven't done something like this in a long time.